I am now going to progress on from that beautiful introduction to an application of CRISPR technology in the lab. And what I'm using the CRISPR technology for is to identify new cancer drug tar targets. Excuse me. So I'm not using CRISPR as the drug, it's to use it to identify potential druggable targets. So I'm going to start with uh, a bold statement. And I truly believe this statement, CRISPR technology is a game changer in the search for new, more effective cancer therapies. And I was going to back this up with lots of figures and lots of stats of the unmet need that we have out there, the cancers we can't cure. And like, those numbers are completely accurate, but they kind of hide the reality that we see with patients. And I'm constantly reminding myself, sometimes you get stuck in the lab for months on end, that you're doing this for the patients. So the reason I actually got into cancer research was back in 2000, my mum had leukemia. And she was the one survivor of maybe 10, 12 people that were treated around the same time. Two of the people that passed away had actually been cured of their leukemia, but it was the chemotherapy they never recovered from. And one of the nurses told us at the time that in the previous 20 to 30 years, the main advance that was actually helping patients was anti-sickness drugs. So the main advance that was helping people was to make them tolerate the chemotherapy. So naive teenage me was like, this isn't good enough. We have to be able to do better. And you know, maybe, hopefully I'm a little bit wiser now. I've been working in the cancer field for seven or eight years at this stage, I realize it's actually quite difficult to find <laughs> these novel targets. But I really feel that CRISPR is the tool that's going to help push us over the edge and help us actually really combat this disease in a really controlled manner. And how it's going to help is it's chemotherapy versus a targeted therapy. So we all know the chemotherapies, it's a Drugs that generally just affect all cells that are doubling. So cancer cells tend to double quite quickly. They have a high proliferation rate. Chemotherapy should target those. But it also targets every normal cell in your body that happens to proliferate quite fast. So this is why patients on chemotherapy will lose their hair. These are the side effects we know of. And this chemotherapy is just not very specific. It's just going to target everything in your body. Whereas targeted therapies, if we can find a vulnerability in the cancer cell that's not present in the normal cell, and then we can develop a drug to target this, it's only going to target the cancer cells and your normal cells should generally be okay. So this is where I think CRISPR can really just come to the fore because it's so efficient, it's so precise, and it really gives us the tool in the lab that we can find out exactly what's going on in these cancer cells. So when I was in uni, actually, there was only six hallmarks of cancer. There's 10 now, so I don't know if I'm getting old or it just shows the wealth of knowledge that's happened in the last five or six years. We know so much about what makes a cancer cell uh, survive and what gives it an advantage over the normal cells. But what we need to know now is what are the specific drivers underlying these mechanisms? So Cancer cells are going to be resistant to cell death. They're going to have um, uncontrolled proliferation. How can we actually use this information? How can we find those key drivers that we could use um, as drug targets? And that's what my um, project is. So we have this fancy, um, uh, our major scientific objectives that we put in the grant to convince people to give us money. Basically, as I tell my mom, I'm just looking for new cancer drug tar targets and use CRISPR to do this. So how do I go about this? Um, I play a giant game of Kerplunk. I don't know how familiar I are, you are with Kerplunk. So in the game, there's a bunch of uh, sticks that are supporting um, a bunch of marbles. One by one, you pull out a stick, and the aim is to not let the marbles fall. But you don't know what the function of a stick was before you pull it out. So you pull out a stick, there's three things that can happen. The first thing is no marbles fall. That stick was not essential to support the marbles. Exact same with CRISPR. I switch off a gene, the cell doesn't die, that gene was not essential to support that cell. You could pull out a stick in Kerplunk, some of the marbles fall down. It wasn't quite essential to supporting them all, but it did have a role to play. You're not quite as healthy in the game as you were before you pulled out the stick. 
in the cell system, when I switch off a gene with CRISPR, maybe I slow down a cell. I don't quite kill it, but I can slow it down, reduce the fitness. This is what we call a cytostatic effect. It's still useful, um, especially if you've got tumors that are growing that maybe you need to stop, and then um, surgery becomes an option if you can slow the growth of it. So it's still um, an important thing that we look for. And then the third and final um, outcome is you pull a stick and all the marbles fall. You are out of the game. And this is what I'm really looking for um, in my project. When we switch off a gene, can we kill the cell? If that cell dies, we have identified a gene that is essential to the survival of the cell. And any good drug is going to be killing our cancer cells. Like that's the real aim that we want to go for um, in this study. So as you saw in the last talk, um, you can go, Vicente's approach is gene by gene. You look at one gene, really deep, delve deep into the mechanism of it. Um, I work at Sanger, and we like to do things big. <laughs> it's, it's big, get bigger, go home. So we are doing this at a genome scale. So how do I actually do this? So instead of having one guide RNA, um, I have a library of my CRISPR or guides. So my library is over 100,000 guides. It targets 20,000 genes. So that's about five guides per gene. I will put this library on top of a pool of cancer cells. So we have a panel of over 1,000 cancer cells that have originally been derived from patients. Um, it's covering 30 different types of cancer. I'll put my library on top of the cancer cells. I'll let my CRISPR work for 14 days. And then at the end, I'll sequence and count the guides that are left. So we sequence and count the guides in the library at the start, and we sequence and count them at the end. And whatever guides we can't find at the end, we conclude that they have switched off an essential gene in a cell, and that cell has died, so that you lose the guide from the population. So it's kind of illustrated there, the two um, cells that are kind of faded out. An essential gene has been hit, those cells have died. So when we count at the start, so if you look at the, on the table, guide RNA1, we had 100 copies of it at the start. We have 100 copies of it at the end. That guide targeted a gene that was non-essential. It's like pulling out the stick, no marbles fall. Guide number two, we started off with 150 copies of it. We end up with 10. That guide has killed ev nearly every cell it has gone into. We have targeted an essential gene. And then there's also the reciprocal that, as one of my colleagues criticized my Kerplunk analogy, you can get a case where if you switch off a gene, the cell actually proliferates more. So you get more copies of it at the end. So with guide number three, we start off with 130, we get 200. This tends to happen in the case of a tumor suppressor gene. So you switch off a tumor suppressor gene, that cancer cell just it get, it starts to grow faster. It has a huge advantage. So what I'm looking for are the situations like guide number two, where we actually lose the cells out of the system. So what I'm doing in my project and what I've set up um, is we're going to do a whole genome CRISPR screen in over 400 cancer cell lines. So we're going to create profiles of essential genes across all these cell lines that are across numerous different tissue types. And what we do with these profiles, so the heat map on the right represents our cell line vulnerability profiles. We also have a huge amount of omics for our cell lines. We've studied them really, really deeply. So we have sequenced all the exomes, so we know what the mutations are. We've done copy number um, analysis, so we know if genes are amplified or if they've been lost. We also have RNA-seq data, so we know um, genes that are expressed and not expressed. And then we also have methylation data. So we know if a promoter is methylated, whether or not that gene is switched on or switched off. So what we want to do with our CRISPR data is to layer this on top and combine all the different omics to see what extra information we can pull out. And this is important because if we can find what's called synthetic lethality, so this is an interaction where a guide is only essential in a cell that has a specific biomarker. So the first uh, specific mutation that we can use as a biomarker. So in the top example, we have a cell line. It's wild type for gene X. We put our library on it. 
it's not vulnerable when we knock out the gene. But then, if you have a cell line that harbors a very specific mutation in gene X, we put our library on it and we find guides that are essential just in the context of the mutation. We can then use that to, obviously, if it's a good drug target, when we get to the clinic, it complete, it, we're able to use it for patient stratification. Just select the patients that are actually going to benefit. There's no point in giving drugs to a patient who won't benefit because there are still side effects to targeted therapy. It's not perfect. Nobody wants to be pumping chemicals into someone if it's not going to do any good. So our kind of absolute aim, and we don't know if we're going to be able to do it, is to find an essential gene in a specific genomic context. So that's kind of our key question that we're asking. And like I said, Sanger like to go big. So this um, project is part of what's called Open Targets. So it's a public-private partnership between the Sanger Institute, the European Bioinformatics Institute, and GSK. So there's three different institutes involved in this. It spans three of the different faculty teams in Sanger. We've got about 30 people will get their hands on my samples at some point from the start to the finish, whether that's IT support for tracking, bioinformatics analysis at the end, the lab technicians. This type of project could not be done anywhere other than Sanger. It's absolutely immense. So we have a facility in Sanger called CGAP, so Cellular Generation and Phenotyping. These do all my cell culture for me. So they will grow all my cells. They make the cells express the Cas9, so the Cas9 is what does the actual cutting. And they'll put the CRISPR guides into the cells for me. They then pass on to the sample management team where we extract DNA. And then we amplify up the guides that are left just so that when we go to sequence, it's easier for us. We have more guides. It's just easier to sequence at the end. The bespoke sequencing team take these amplified guides and do next generation sequencing so that we have our counts at the end of the guides and we can compare them back to our original counts. And then the analysis. So obviously we then have to identify essential genes. It's a lot more complicated than two tables that <laughs> you just take them away. But we've developed several um, bespoke algorithms for doing that. And then a key thing as well is just because a gene is essential does not mean it's a good target. There's several genes that we're never going to be able to target with drugs. And a key part is selecting the genes that are going to be the best targets. So target prioritization is a key part of our analysis as well. And just to try to give you some concept of the scale. So the tissue culture that we do, we use multi-layer flasks, which are illustrated on the top left. It's about eight centimeters tall. If we were to stack all the flasks that we've used to date, the size of that stack would be as high as the CN Tower in Toronto. And by the time we finish this, if we were to stack all of our flasks, there is no building on Earth that will be taller. So we had to go into Middle Earth, I don't know if we've any Lord of the Rings fans, <laughs> to Sauron's Tower is the only tower, only building we could find that would um, eclipse our stack of flasks. So this is science at an industrial scale. And it's fantastic to work somewhere like Sanger where you have the resources and you can ask these big questions and you can just really get so much information that is difficult to get in other places. So moving on to where I've actually um, looked to date. So we've processed fully over 200 cell lines. Um, the, what I'm going to show you today is just the analysis of the first 130. And I say just, but this is probably the second or third biggest data set of this kind in the world. So, How does that compare to the screening? So it's been three years, but we've only been actually screening for the last 18 months. So I had to set up the pipeline. It's taken experiments like Vicente does and just scaling them up, um, putting in QC, tech transfer into all the different teams. So the first 18 months to two years of pipeline development. Um, the rate we're screening at now is we can screen about 150 a year. So that's pretty good because we actually have really, really tight um, quality control. And it's tighter, I know, than some of the other screens that are done. So we are actually quite hard on ourselves. We set very high thresholds for, say, the Cas9 that we have, so the enzyme that cuts. We're, we test how efficient that is. And if the efficiency isn't above 80%, we don't use that line. Where I've seen people publish with efficiency down at 40 to 50%. 
So we're being quite hard because we just want high quality data. So like I said, I, what I'm going to show you now is the first 130 lines and they're covering these kind of five main tissue types. So the first um, key question, have I found any essential genes? And yes, I have. So the first bar chart is each of the 130 cell lines individually. They're color coded by tumor type. Um, so it's the same as the graph on the bottom. And we have identified over three and a half thousand genes that are essential in at least one cell line. And then when we aggregate these into their tumor types, there's over 2,000 genes that are essential in at least one tumor type. So this is a huge amount of genes to work with. Generally, we get just above the 1,000 mark. So the average we get is about 11, um, 1,100 essential genes per cell line. So we delved into these essential genes a little bit further. And the first thing we tried to identify were core essential genes. So genes that we have found that are essential in every cell line or every tumor type. And this is important because one of the drawbacks of this study is we don't have any normal samples. So I work with cell lines that grow on plastic in a flask. Cancer cell lines do that really, really well because of all the traits that make them cancer. They're aggressive, they grow fast, they don't really care what's around them. A normal cell is not going to do that. You can't grow a normal cell on plastic. And there are so-called normal lines available, but they've had to have been immortalized in some way. Some will have an SV40 virus put into them. Some will have the telomerase mutated so that they're not going to die. They're not a clear representation of normal. So we decided to identify core essential genes with the theory that if a gene is essential in every cancer type we look at, chances are it's going to be essential in every single, in every single cell that, that is out there. So it's going to be core um, functions like ribosomal proteins. Or you're not going to survive without your ribosomal proteins, your spliceosome, your DNA replication. So these core functions that we know are not good, good drug targets. So then the next question, like I said, was how do we prioritize? How are we going to actually se select the best targets? So we developed a prioritization scoring system. So this is based on two types of information. So the first tier of information is the experimental data that I have generated. So have we found it to be essential in, um, in the cell line? There's, we grade the different levels of essentiality as well. Sometimes when you switch off a gene, the cell just dies, it's gone. It was really, really essential. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer so that maybe that's not as essential. Then the second context is the biological context. So we look at patient information for this. So like, is the gene mutated in a patient population? Or is it associated with a mutation in a cell that might be our th therapeutic biomarker? And we add these two scores together. And you can see in the distribution plot, the highest score that a, um, a gene can get is one. And you can see it kind of peaks around the 0.3 for two tissue types, so breast and large intestine or colon cancer. But you can see to the right, there is a tail of targets that seem to fulfill a lot of the criteria that we have predefined as making a good target. So where I'm going to focus is the genes that are getting close to one. So these are going to be highly depleted. They're going to be mutated in patients. They're going to be what we feel is most relevant to the disease. And then... What was quite reassuring was in breast and colon, our top ranked targets were genes and gene products that are already being treated in the clinic. So there's already drugs for PIK3CA and RBB2. So that's HER2. RBB2 is HER2. And there's already drugs in the clinic targeting these. And then in colon cancer, KRAS and EGFR, and there is drugs available. So it was quite reassuring that we were pulling out known targets. But then there's a lot of novelty as well. And there's a couple here that are just really, really interesting that I'm not allowed to tell you in case there's some industrial spy in the audience. GSK wouldn't be too happy with me for that. Um, so then the GSK people have really come up Trump for us as well. So it's really great to be involved in this academic um, public company partnership. So GSK has so much information on the tractability or the drug ability of a target. So they've shared that information with us. And what they do is they have 10 different buckets. And a target goes, goes into a bucket based on, it goes into bucket number one, 
if there's an FDA approved drug on the market. And then it goes into bucket two or three if there's a drug targeting that gene or that gene product in clinical trials. And then as you go down, there's less information known. So the targets that we find in the higher numbered buckets, it doesn't mean they're bad targets. It means they haven't been studied as much to date. So they haven't been progressed as far. Some of them are going to be completely crap, never going to be a drug target, but you just have to kind of look into that. So that's been a real key benefit of working with GSK on this project. So as I said earlier, it would be really great if we could find an essential gene that's linked with a specific genomic marker. And we found several of known, known associations. So these two examples here again are breast and colon cancer. It's well known that can co breast cancer cells that are mutant for PIK3CA are dependent on, on PIK3CA. So if you switch off PIK3CA, those cells will die. Uh, but if you switch it off in the wild type, those cells won't die. So in the scatter plot on the left, the purple dots are the mutated cell lines. And their two axes are the depletion scores that we have generated from our CRISPR data. And you can see that all the purple dots converge on the lower scores. So the more depleted, um, the cell lines that are more dependent and are more vulnerable to pick 3 ca inhibition are the mutant lines, whereas the grey dots are fine. They don't care that we've, um, that we've switched off pick 3 ca And then the bar chart as well illustrates that, just same data, different illustration. All the blue bars, it's enriched for the mutant lines. So the blue bar going down means that gene is depleted and that cell line is dependent on that gene and that's enriched for the mutants. And then that's the same situation for KRAS mutants in colon as well. So one of the um, really interesting challenges is working with something like CRISPR. CRISPR is so new, there's a lot of things that we haven't quite figured out yet. And one of the things that everyone is witnessing is if there's a copy number amplification in your cell line, it seems to cause a bias for false positives uh, using CRISPR. So I'll go through it step by step. So if you have a chromosome, one copy or your two copies of the gene, you hit it with CRISPR. If you hit a non-essential gene, your cell generally repairs it, it's fine, it carries on, it doesn't really even realize anything happened. In cancer cells, we frequently get these copy number amplifications. So instead of there being one site for the CRISPR, there's multiple sites along the chromosome that the CRISPR will actually cut. And the theory is that this will either completely overwhelm the cell based on toxicity because there's so many double strand breaks, or you end up losing a complete chunk of your chromosome. You lose a bunch of genes. You're not going to be um, able to survive. So these are actually seen as false positives. So these might not be genes that are essential. It's just because there's multiple copies, you're getting this different type of toxicity. So one of the first things we had to do was actually figure out, first of all, is it a problem? And it is. And second of all, can we correct for this bias in our data so that we don't get false hits just because there's multiple copies? So this is a real example. So um, this is chromosome seven from one of our cell lines. You can see the blue lines on the top illustrate the copy number of the, each of these genes. And then you can see the middle, um, the middle section there, all those green dots are individual guides and it, the full change is if they're depleted or not. So if they've been identified as essential. And if you focus on the brown bar, you can see that where we have this copy number amplification where we have eight copies of this, there seems to be a bias go for depleted genes in that region. But chances are you're not going to have multiple genes in one region that are all essential. So we actually correct for this um, using an algorithm developed by my bioinformatician from the European Bioinformatics Institute. So you can see on the bottom there that the black line evens out. So it's no longer um, influenced by the copy number, influenced by increased levels of depletion but you still see single black dots that are actually the real hits. So we don't lose real hits, um, but we get rid of the false positives. And what this distribution on the right shows that non-expressed amplified genes, so it, if a gene is not in, uh, expressed, it should never be an essential gene. But you can see the light blue peak slightly to the left of zero. We are calling non-expressed genes 
as essential, but after we apply our correction method, it brings them back to center around <laughs> zero. So these are clearly false positives and we're correcting for them, which is quite important for me identifying new targets. So I said at the start, targeted therapy is great, but there is some issues with it. Um, resistance can develop to targeted therapy. It can be because of the heterogeneous nature of a tumor. You might have a subset of the tumor that just has a second or third mutation that makes it resistant to your drug. Or cancer cells are, it's a really genetic unstable environment. They'll pick up extra mutations and they might acquire resistance. So CRISPR can also be applied to identify um, cause, different causes of resistance and then nominate candidates for combination therapy. So going forward, you hear of multiple drugs being given in combination to try hit multiple pathways and reduce the chance of resistance developing. So a well-known example is dibrafenib resistance in colon cancer. So dibrafenib targets a very specific mutation of BRAF, and this mutation in, is also found in melanoma. Melanoma patients always, nearly always respond to dibrafenib. So they found the same mutation in colon, so they thought, let's treat with dibrafenib. But the colon patients were not responding, and they didn't know why. So years of research went into figuring out why dibrafenib wasn't killing BRAF mutant colon. And what they found was, if you inhibit the mutated BRAF, this second signaling pathway kicks in, and to actually kill the colon cancer cells, you need to inhibit EGFR and BRAF at the same time. So the combination therapy is given in the clinic, targeting these two pathways, and that kills off the cell. So that took years of research and a lot of prior knowledge on cell signaling to figure this out. So as a proof principle, I went in with my CRISPR to see if I could figure it out a bit quicker. And in a space of about six weeks, this is what I found. So instead of just putting my whole genome CRISPR library onto my cells, I put CRISPR onto my cells and I put dibrafenib onto my cells. So the only cells that should die are the ones that have dibrafenib and also have EGFR inhibited by my CRISPR. So my question was, can I use CRISPR to find EGFR? So I knew what the answer was. And what you can see here is, this is the layout of the experiment. The yellow branch is where I added the dibrafenib, and the black is my control. You can see with the over time in the graph on the bottom, my control, if you look at EGFR fold change, it does not change in the control. So EGFR is not essential in the control cells. Once you add dibrafenib, EGFR suddenly becomes um, essential, and you now have a candidate for a combination therapy. So what this means is that we can use CRISPR. So if we have a drug that we know should work in a cancer, but it's not, instead of having lots of prior knowledge on the signaling, we can just throw our whole genome CRISPR on it and see what genes come out in combination and what would be good candidates for a combination therapy. And this is just going to be so much quicker and so much more efficient than one single lab looking for this one combination for years and years. So I'm going to finish on the same statement I started with. Hopefully, I've convinced you that CRISPR technology is a game changer. If I haven't, just think of it this way. I've described one application of CRISPR, so the knockout, the switching off of genes. We can also activate genes using CRISPR. We can also inhibit the genes, but not completely cut them, so they're not completely switched off. We can inhibit them, we can turn them back off. Like Vicente illustrated, we can introduce specific mutations. Another thing we can also do is you can have a version of the Cas9 enzyme that we call dead Cas9, so it's not going to cut. But because CRISPR and Cas9 are so efficient at directing you to a certain part of a genome, you can attach another protein to Cas9. So you can attach a methylation protein, and you can bring it to a very specific part of the genome, methylate that region, and switch on, switch off genes as you please. So if I haven't convinced you with my data, just this is one application of it. And as you saw, like the main papers came out in 2012. It's only five years. Who knows where we can go next? So hopefully I've convinced you a little bit. I'm convinced, and I do look at it all day, every day, though. 
But just to thank, uh, this is a huge project, um, thank everyone involved, specifically my boss, uh, Matthew Garnett, who himself and Kasuke came up with this concept and applied to Open Targets for the funding. And then somehow I convinced them to give me a job to have an opportunity to work on this. So huge thank you to them and everyone who's involved. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>